Good morning. We're in a new series, uh, second week today, and I'm reading from Isaiah 61, from the passage that begins, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and we're looking at uh, fragments of that that uh, are also repeated in the book of Luke when Jesus read from the synagogue. This is how it reads in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, and pr to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. That's just the two verses, and again, the context goes further than that. This is a, a prophecy uh, but I want you to see it as a promise. God promised that these solutions would enter a world that has issues, shall we say. Have you noticed, does anybody notice that the world has issues? I'm curious. That's escaped your notice. Um, that is, the world that Jesus came into had issues, and the world that remains continues to have issues. It, it seems to be uh, kind of a human problem. If uh, you know how I, can, I get along with people just, I get along with mankind just fine as the people I have trouble with. Um, the second phrase in that is not actually in uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament and therefore that's what was used to... to uh, uh, go and translate Luke, uh, we're missing the phrase that I want us to focus on, and uh, that's the second reason I wanted to use Isaiah 61 to look at this. Who are those who are brokenhearted that need to be bound up? Now, I want to warn you if, you, if you're a Google or a concordance type person and you look this up, you're going to get this chapter. <laughs> and a couple of others that I'll, I'll read for you today. And it's almost as if that's all that's ever said about it. And I think that's because brokenheartedness is kind of a big way of describing a lot of conditions, a lot of reasons uh, that hearts get broken. And, uh, you know, I, I learned about this in, in the second grade, and... Uh, when she didn't want to have any more to do with me. Uh, I can't remember her name, but it really broke my heart. Um, and then there's, you know, more recently, uh, the heart of my mother, as my dad passed, despite her inability to remember what happened five minutes before, um, that one stayed with her, at least for a few hours, and then we had to live it several times a day as time went by, and that was a broken heart in operation. So, boy, it really can cover a lot of ground, and, uh, and I think we're all familiar. Uh, we know it when we see it, right? So let's uh, look at a psalm, and by the way, psalms is, is great for broken hearts, and all other kind of hearts, by the way. Um, this is Psalm 69, and just four verses of it. Save me, O God. For the waters have threatened my life. That would be one possibility. I have sunk in deep mire. There's no foothold. I, I have no certainty of, of being able to stand up. I've come into deep waters. A flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. That means I'm watching and watching and watching and <laughs> my eyes are starting not to work because I'm watching so long. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are powerful being wrongfully my enemies. Now somewhere in that, I bet you've had one of those experiences or feelings. Somewhere in there, and that's just one psalm where Broken heartedness sort of exhibits itself and, and it shows up in our body as in our emotions 
in our sense of, of well-being and certainly in our souls. Um, Jesus came to heal that. He came to bind it up. That's put a, put a bandage on it so it doesn't get further injured like the piece of grass we were looking at today. There's another prophecy and I, I want to uh, I want to read a a couple of places where this word shows up and it talks about what God does. And uh, the first is Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, 17. This is a widely quoted, I believe this is the third most quoted uh, verses in Isaiah. For thus says the, the high and exalted one who lives forever whose name is Holy. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Now, <laughs> this is one of those opposite passages. You know, yes, God is great, big, and whole, and all of the things that we say about him are true. And your assumption might be that he didn't really have time for your troubles. And that would be really wrong. Because he likes to revive those who are troubled. He likes to bring a revived spirit and heart to their bodies. And that's, that's just one Psalm, back to uh, the Psalms, Psalm 34. Uh, again, it's probably, definitely will come up in any kind of search you do. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So there's some pretty good, uh, there's some pretty good promises uh, since being broken hearted is such a common malady and a problem and an issue in all of the times from then to, to now the message I think of all these passages is he revives he revives uh, there's, there is a tomorrow <laughs> there's a next week there's a next year there's a next the rest of my life even when my heart is what I would call broken. And doesn't that suggest that it can't be repaired? I mean, it's broken. This is my heart we're talking about. If it's broken, I mean, how do you fix that? Well, your Creator knows how to fix it because He made it. So He's, he's all over that. David, and, and this is uh, Psalm 51, when David sinned, uh, 17 verses into this chapter, which is full of confession and all kinds of requests of God, David observes the sacrifices of God, the ones he really pays attention to, are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. I... I think there's absolutely nothing more insulting and damaging than to have a feeling and then to have someone on the outside look at your feeling and see what it is and then just kind of, eh, so what? <laughs> that was my heart you just stomped on. And so we have a God, and, and David, is, David is broken. David has really messed up. He's done something that no human being should ever do. More than one something. And certainly, in answering to God for what he's done, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to ask yourself, can God forgive something this bad? Apparently, David asked that question. But he says, here's what I know. If my heart is broken and it's contrite, which I'll define as bruised, <laughs> honestly, it's uh, broken. Broken. If it's there, he's not going to despise that. He's not going to make fun of that. He's not going to pass it off lightly. He's not going to say that's no big deal. He sees it for what it is, and, and he, can, he can revive that. 
So the bruised, the lowly, the crushed, all of these, all of these phrases come out of these uh, promises of God. Now, I, I did this because Isaiah brings it up, and, and I just want you to see, and there's, the actual word is not used a lot in the Bible. I pretty much read to you the passages that, I'm, that I found. But our, our discussion is about Jesus this month. As we count down the weeks, the way Jesus was counting down the weeks on his way back to Jerusalem to be put on the cross and, and to die, this is, this is the passage he's fulfilling. And he's, he's doing all kinds of things with people who are broken hearted. I have selected three. And the first is Mark chapter 1. I recommend reading the book of Mark. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how fast you can read the book of Mark. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying you're through it before you know it. All of a sudden, you're, you know, he's in his triumphal entry, and you go, whoa, I hardly read that many chapters. You know. But in Mark chapter 1, this seems to be one of the early events, as the other Gospels also present it, it just simply says, a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, we don't really understand this disease. There are pictures of, of leprosy and... Uh, it's not pretty. And, and what happened to, to people who were suffering from leprosy is they began to have sores and then they, they didn't really heal and it was contagious and it was spreading and pretty soon, you know, the end of your nose wasn't there and your ears really weren't there and, you know, your, your face was kind of rounded because your, anything that stuck out would, had fallen off. Which made it a little hard to hide, you know, if you wanted to sneak in somewhere and buy something at the hardware store, you know, they'd probably figure it out real quick. And then there was the bandage that would go around your head. And then there was the practice of if you were walking down the street, minding your own business, people would say, leper, leper. Now that, that, that's really helpful when you're trying to be invisible. So you're not going to get close to anybody. And so the very first sentence, the very first phrase is a miracle in and of itself. The leper came to Jesus. What it took for him to even show up was the last sentence. You can make me clean. But he's beseeching him. That's begging. I'm falling on my knees in front of you. I'm not getting near you. And here's my question, Jesus. Are you willing to make me clean? You see, no one in this man's life has ever been willing to do anything for him. No one. Are you willing to stand still? Are you willing not to yell quite so loud? Are you willing to just, just kind of leave me alone and let me sit here for a while without exposing me and making me have to move again? Horrible horrible situation. I'm emphasizing the brokenness, but I, but I have to tell you, Jesus touched him. Nobody touches a leper. But then when he touched him, he wasn't a leper anymore. Funny how that works. This man was outcast miserable, miserable, and banned, banned from anything public. I mean, talk about cancel culture. that You couldn't get more canceled than elect. That's, that's just what happened. And he knew enough about Jesus that he saw possibilities and he was right. Because Jesus is not going to break that off just because it's bent. If your heart is broken and nobody likes you and everybody just wants you to go away, 
Jesus doesn't feel that way. The second one is John chapter 5. In John 5, we're, we're kind of given the, the surroundings, the setting for this situation. They're in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate pool, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, which you may recognize from the news because we have a hospital there. Having five porticos. Now, at this setting, this place, this very, very public place, there was a man who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? Amazing question. I'd love to chase that rabbit. But just looking at the man, he, he can't walk. Okay. He's, he has a sickness and he's at a pool and I didn't read all the verses but there was, there was a saying that you know if you got down to the water when it kind of bubbled up then the first person in gets healed. So somehow he gets down to the edge of the pool and he's sick and he's really close. I don't know if he was there for 38 years. I'm going to think not. But he'd been by the pool really close to a solution for a long time. It's hopeless. If you can't walk, how are you going to get in the pool? You can drag yourself on your elbows, but other people can run faster than you can drag your elbows. This is a no-win scenario. But he doesn't have anywhere else to go, so he at least gets close to wherever the solution is. That's, that's as good as it gets. This breaks my heart from another standpoint. I, I know people who are on the edge of success. Who are on the brink of life being better. As if it's one more step and, and so much would change. And for whatever reason, they can't seem to make that last step. And that's heartbreaking. And I think this man was heartbroken. Well, you know, I don't want to leave it completely hanging. I want to talk about the brokenheartedness, but Jesus' next sentence is, pick up your mat and walk out of here. <laughs> now, he's not, he's not being mean, because if the guy would just pick up his mat and walk, he would be able to do that. He doesn't have to go in the water. He doesn't have to wait for it to bubble. He just, he just picks up his mat and walks out. Now, you can't get faster than that. So Jesus took care of it. He came to bind that up. But he, he didn't just bind it up so the guy, you know, limped for a while. He completely healed him. And he got in trouble for doing it. Well, the brokenheartedness that we're maybe a little more familiar with, the last one I want to look at is John chapter 11. And I'm just, John chapter 11 is an extremely long chapter. There's all kinds of explanation as to how this happened, but this is uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus with his other two friends, Mary and Martha. Uh, Lazarus gets sick and he dies. And there's, there's some things associated with that that are kind of important, but these two questions just state the brokenness of these two women as... as as friendly as they are and as faithful as they are to Jesus, Martha then said to Jesus, verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now that, that sounds like a very accusing question. Like the next phrase is, where in the world were you? That's not what happened. I mean, she goes on to say, you know, even now I know, you know, things are going to be okay. And they had a little talk about resurrection and all that kind of stuff. So it, was a, it, was a very, it was a very warm conversation that lasted for several minutes. But notice that Mary, who's not there, Mary's, you might say, down the street. And, and they said, Jesus is here. So she gets up to find Jesus and she goes toward Jesus. When Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him 
she fell at his feet, saying to him, she's falling while she's talking, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's verse 32. Do you remember the shortest verse of the Bible? It's two verses later. Three, Jesus wept. That's not that simple. She's falling on her knees. Her friends are all surrounding her crying. Jesus sees all this grief around him. People are just broken hearted. And he's going to raise the guy from the dead. And he starts crying. Why? Because you can't be around broken heartedness without being affected. Not if you're Jesus. And he saw it. And he joined it. And he experienced it. And then he fixed it. These people were grieved. Complete sad is just such a too simple a word, right? Sad. Yeah, well, you might say that. That's how your grief goes, right? You're just sad. No, it's really deeper than that, isn't it? But Mary is so weakened, physically weakened by the sadness and by the grief that as she, as she walks where she wants to go, she can't even finish the steps and she goes down while she's talking. She collapses at Jesus' feet. She'll be at Jesus' feet again soon. And Jesus walks over to the tomb and says, Lazarus, come out! And here he comes. Four days in the tomb. And yeah, he wants to dry the tears and he wants to revive the spirit of these people. But he wants to do so much more than that. He wants to really fix it. He does not heal the wound slightly. He really fixes it. And that's the one who's come to save us. I want to draw four very, very simple conclusions. Number one, he seeks. Many of the times that Jesus does something, I mean, Jesus had to go to the pool to find this guy, right? He had to, he had to go where that guy was. That guy wasn't walking anywhere. He didn't say, well, I'll be over here, you know, Tuesday, Thursday at 1 o'clock. Uh, he goes to the pool and he helps the man. He's, he can't stand it. If he knows something is going on, he's going go, to go be near it because he's near the brokenhearted. That's, that's the promise of God. So Jesus looks for ways to bless. I think that's a good marching order for us. I'm real bad about not seeing some things. I can walk by something and not realize what I've just passed. I can read something and not realize there was a phrase in there I really would have been really good to mention, but I didn't see it. You know, that, that's, that's just, we're all a little bit that way. But, but when you're intentionally looking for something, uh, especially something like brokenheartedness, I think we'll find it, don't you? I think there's enough of it around we'll, we'll stumble onto some somewhere. We'll look for it. But secondly, he is present. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He, he's not aloof. He's not too lofty. He's high. He's holy. But he's with contrite and the lowly of spirit. Jesus is with everyone. The leper comes to him. He touches him. The man at the pool explains his situation and, and you know, Jesus already knew all that. How did Jesus know that? You say, well, he was the son of God. Or, he, you know, maybe been at Bethesda before. Who knows? But he's present. And he's certainly present. Lord, if you'd been here. <laughs> because I know if you're present, Lord, things don't turn out the same way. And, and they were sure of that. And they were right. But now he's present and things aren't going to turn out like they thought. And I think even in our very limited compared to Jesus sort of way, 
There are very few places that we go where brokenheartedness exists that being present isn't part of the solution. A lot of times people will say, what do you say when someone, and they describe some kind of brokenheartedness? And I finally learned that the answer to that is nothing. Just go sit. I've, I've visited a lot of hospitals and I learned in my very first ministry <laughs> what they cared about was whether I cared, whether I was there, whether I was with them. Listen to what the doctor says. Remind them of things they already forgot because they were kind of rattled when the doctor was talking so fast. Being present makes a difference. And we can't always do it. And Jesus wasn't as a human being everywhere. Imagine that. He had to go seek it out and he had to go be present intentionally and he could only be present for this group at a time. We can be present. That's something miraculous in a way that we can do. Third, all that really isn't worth very much except in Jesus. He is powerful. <laughs> Leprosy? There were no doctors taking care of that. I mean, you know, healing it. Fixing it. You can't walk. You can't walk for 38 years. It wasn't because he'd never talked to a physician. You're dead in the tomb. Uh, the creator is going to have to deal with this one. Because he's the one that has life in his hands. And he, and he handles all of it. And he handles it for boys and girls and young and old and people who are near to God and people who think God's long since forgotten about them because they're Gentiles and they live off somewhere else. I mean, he is powerful. And if there's anything that everybody figured out real quick about Jesus is that he could do it. He could bring healing to the situation. He could revive even someone who was dead. Now, you're asking, how do I apply that? Because I don't feel so powerful. <laughs> you're not alone either. Now, I didn't say you go sit and you spout out words of Jesus because he's the powerful one and you, you just sit and talk and talk and talk and talk. No. Now, remember, we're going to be quiet. But I have the heart of Jesus... If I've watched what he does and I go try to be present somewhere, there is power in that. And, and in whatever gets said in an encouraging sort of way, there's power. And God will find a way to work through feeble hands to help someone. I've told you many times, I will tell you it happened again this week. Someone walks in the door at Moving Forward, they need some help. And I'm thinking to myself, oh boy. And then I look over in the, the chair and a person who has come in to be helped opens their mouth and helps the situation. There's power. But sometimes it doesn't come from you. Sometimes you just get to watch. And that's really cool. But there is power. And God is not limited. And God can take care of situations simply because we ask Him to. There's certainly power in prayer. And those are words that are comforting as well. And finally, and I, I, I hadn't put this one in until this morning. I was going back through and I think, what? He is willing. Oh, yeah, that one's kind of important. He, he, he wants to be near the brokenhearted. He's willing to help. The leper says, nobody I've ever met is willing. And if, you know, I know you can do it. If, if you're willing to do it, you can do it. He's kind of like, oh, this may not work. <laughs> How sad. Yes, he's willing. Jesus says, yes, I am willing to be cleansed. He is willing to forgive. Ask David. He is willing to walk with you 
in dark places. He's willing to hear and wipe your tears. Brokenheartedness does not intimidate Jesus. And it doesn't change what he's going to do about it. Because he's willing. And thankfully he's able, and thankfully he's present. I, I wanted to find a different verse, and I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't find a different verse. This is what I read at the end of the sermon last week. Jesus says, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, burdened down, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We're marching toward Resurrection Day. And you know, Jesus is going to learn some hard lessons about brokenheartedness. Some people say his heart broke on the cross because the spear revealed blood and water. Even if that's not true. Jesus has actually walked in the shoes that you've been in. And so all of the things that we've talked about are true because he wants to help, but it's also true because now he's experienced these things. And so today, when I invite you to come to Him, I, I have no reservations whatever. I'm suggesting the one thing that can truly help you. And He's willing, and He's able, and He's present. And what I can't do, and what we can't do, He will. And so today, if, if you've not known what it's like to have a burden lifted, to have your heart revived, Come and find out. Let the burden that you carry be left never to be seen again. Let the pain that you feel be healed and healed again and again as long as it takes. Will you come while we stand and sing? I am I no more, I am I no more, I've been bought with blood, I am I no more, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord, and He rules my life. Jesus is my Lord, He will come again, He will come again. And he'll take me home, he will come again. I am I no more, I am I no more, I've been bought with blood. I am mine no more. Be seated. Oh, wow. Some really great things have happened this week. And we're, we're still very much in process um, on some Bible studies with Laura. But her heart is busting in a different sort of way this morning because tomorrow she's going to gain possession of her very own apartment and get to start moving this week and we we just really rejoice with you in that it's 
been a long, long time waiting and being turned down and t turned away and ignored and all the things that happen in those kind of processes. And she said, I just, I just want to say how grateful I am. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can do that. That's reason enough. So uh, we're going we're gonna to pray a special prayer anyway and uh, rejoice with you and, and keep walking with you. Father in heaven, we are amazed at your great love for us and the blessings that you have for us and your desire for us to be whole. And Father, we're so thankful for Laura and, and uh, the fact that she, she's uh, getting her life together and she's making advances and she's learning about you. And Father, we're uh, just so happy for her today that she is rejoicing and uh, just ask that you continue to bless her and strengthen her and comfort her. And Father, we pray that you'll give us uh, the desire to stand beside her and be with her as she uh, continues to grow. Bless her, Father, and bless all of us for being here today. And, and we just thank you so much for your son Jesus who uh, gave his life that we can have eternal life with you. And it's in his blessed name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand if you would while we close. It's good to see everybody here today. If you're visiting with us, we're really glad you were here and hope you can uh, come back and be with us. Uh, also, remember the potluck and you're welcome to stay if you're visiting. Uh, ask a few of you if you would to gather around Janice and Randy as we close this morning with a prayer. pray together. Father, we thank you for the time that's been given to come here and worship you. Father, we thank you for those who are visiting with us today, and Father, we ask you to bless them, and Father, we also ask you to be with those in our community that are searching and struggling. Help us to be able to help them and show them your love. Father, we ask you to be with all those many um, number that were listed this morning as being ill. Uh, Father, comfort them and help them to return to some measure of health. Father, we ask you to be with uh, Randy and Janice as they've traveled here to be with Juanita. Uh, comfort them and, and comfort Juanita. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings you give us each and every day especially your son, that we might have that home in heaven with you. Christ, let me pray. Amen.